Good morning, everybody. My name is Shira Uriarte, and I'm the Program Manager for Member Education at the Jewish Funders Network. Thank you so much for joining us today for Disaster Response and Preparedness in Jewish Philanthropy. Before we begin the webinar, just a few housekeeping details to share. Um, everyone has joined the webinar in listen-only mode, so if you have questions during the presentation and are joining us from the web, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box you see on the screen in front of you. Also, this webinar is being recorded, so if you do have to jump off for any reason, rest assured you'll be able to listen at a later time. So just a little bit about JFN before we jump into the, the program. JFN works with Jewish funders at the individual and collective level to improve the quality of their giving and maximize their impact as they make the change they want to see in the world. JFN leverages the power and the creativity of networks to strengthen Jewish philanthropy around the world, and our year-round programming aims to keep members up to speed on the latest and most pressing topics in philanthropy in the Jewish community, globally and locally. We aim to help members build their philanthropic toolkits and explore relevant and important issues. In this webinar, our speakers, who will introduce themselves in just a minute, will discuss how the Jewish philanthropic field has responded to disaster. They will talk about how to fund quickly, respond strategically, and find partners on the ground in the midst of a natural disaster. And I'm going to prompt the speakers with questions, but we want to hear from you all. So please type your questions into the Q&A box you see on the screen. I'll read them aloud for the experts to respond to. Um, so now I'd like to have all of our panelists introduce yourselves and the organizations that you represent. And if you could also just talk about the role your organization plays when a natural disaster strikes to begin. Hi, I'm Dina Fuchs. I'm the Senior um, Director of Strategy and Partnerships for the Avichai Foundation. Um, Avichai is dedicated to supporting Jewish day school education and overnight summer camping. Um, we don't have a um, a mission per se to deal with natural disasters, but we do have a mission to focus on our um, our target audiences, which are day schools and camps, and when they're affected or have challenges that they need to address due to um, natural disasters, we, um, we try to step up as best we can. Um, and I can talk about later some of the things that we've done and how that thinking and giving has evolved. Um, just on a personal note, I actually live on the South Shore of Long Island and was a victim of Sandy. And that experience has very much affected how the foundation thinks about the work that we're doing. And I think that might, we can discuss that a little bit later as things evolve. But having someone on the ground and really understanding is I think an important piece of, uh, of the puzzle. Hi, I'm Mark Gervis, Executive Vice President at Jewish Federations of North America. Uh, with 148 local federations and 300 smaller independent communities, uh, we work with our communities uh, around natural disasters in a variety of different ways. Uh, when we know they're coming, uh, we step in uh, with early warning systems and reaching out to every community in the path of a hurricane, for example, to make sure they're prepared. Uh, they've got their lists ready. They've thought about evacuations, all the things that they can do uh, before an emergency. We're in contact as much as we can through uh, the immediate event and uh, very immediately following to help them assess needs, uh, build the picture of what needs to be done, and magnify the issue out across our system when it's going to require a broad system level response. Uh, we will uh, often, when it's a large scale event, uh, mobilize the, our federation system to uh, uh, a mass emergency funding um, and in past large-scale events like Katrina, Sandy, and now uh, Hurricane Harvey, uh, those numbers shoot into the uh, multiple millions, millions. We work with our federations, foundation partners, and really anyone uh, to, uh, to make that possible as, as much as we can. Um, and we're active on that front especially with Hurricane Harvey, working with the Houston Federation uh, and uh, starting that process now across Florida. Uh, we also provide, when warranted, direct assistance on the ground. Since uh, for the past two weeks, we've had uh, JFNA staff as well as senior managers from across federations on the ground in Houston, 
uh, helping the community organize and mobilize uh, and assess the needs and uh, deal with a myriad of tasks. Uh, the third team is on the ground now. Uh, I was there for a week uh, last week. Uh, and finally, we are the conveners of the uh, JVOAD network, that is Jewish Voluntary Organizations Assisting in Disasters. And that network uh, uh, convenes and works together to provide communication and coordination amongst the organizations, both in domestic issues and internationally. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Kaplan. I am the Executive Director of Nahama, Jewish Response to Disaster. We are a on the ground disaster response and recovery nonprofit. Uh, we specialize in, uh, in hands dirty work. So we do debris removal. We do uh, chainsaw teams after tornadoes and hurricanes. But what we're mostly known for is doing what's called muck and gut work. We go into homes, we remove water, uh, clear out damaged goods that the homeowner has and then gut the home down to the studs in order to uh, prepare for long-term recovery. That's what we do 90% of the time after large-scale events like uh, Superstorm Sandy uh, and uh, after Katrina, we have stayed in, uh, in, in disaster regions much longer. We were in Long Island for two and a half years and we moved from response to recovery, rebuilding homes. We're currently on the ground in Houston. We have a team that will be on the ground in Florida next week and we're currently engaged in those uh, response Immediate, immediate response work, and eventually we'll start looking at uh, long-term recovery. My name is Maya Corsoro. Hello, everybody. I'm the Senior Program Director for Disaster Response at the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. I started my tenure at JDC uh, being stationed in the Philippines, in Manila, where I was responsible for leading our recovery effort there and have since uh, been a part of our response efforts in Nepal, Sri Lanka, Haiti, and other countries. And now, of course, the Caribbean. Uh, so to answer the question about what our role is in a disaster, uh, as soon as a disaster strikes, the first thing JDC does is analyze the needs and determine whether or not that warrants a response that JDC uh, can respond to. In tandem, it calls, if there's a Jewish community, it will reach out to the Jewish community, determine whether or not it's been impacted by the disaster. And I'm speaking specifically about international Jewish communities, not North America. And if they have been impacted by the disaster, JDC will respond, like we're doing currently in Cuba. And um, if they haven't been directly impacted, uh, we will normally partner with them on the long term as well as the immediate response. And what does that mean? Uh, how are we responding? First thing we do is do a needs assessment. Uh, sometimes we'll deploy people to the ground in order to do that needs assessment. And we will provide organizations with the capacity that they need in order to respond. And what we often see is many of these local organizations that have the cultural sensitivities, have the language, have the nuance, know how to do community-based work, don't have the expertise in disaster response. And, that's, and they're usually flooded with funding, flooded with needs, and often quite overwhelmed. So JDC will come in by providing them with additional capacity. I was just in Sri Lanka, vetted with a local organization that was responding to the floods over the summer uh, to help them organize the response, um, be aware of some of the sensitivities, ensure that they're meeting international humanitarian standards, and in the longer term, also provide them with capacities that they may need in order to reach out to the most vulnerable populations, like people with disabilities, elderly, to do the key disaster risk reduction and mitigation efforts, and also to address some of those challenging underlying root issues that impact the development of that region and those communities. Thank you. Hi, I'm Milward Kant. I work for the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, as, as my colleague Maya, who you just heard from. Um, but in this capacity, I also serve as the chair of the Jewish Coalition for Disaster Response, which is a coalition of some 46 mostly American-based organizations that respond during times of either natural or man-made disasters overseas. Um, 
Jewish Federations of North America, ADL, American Jewish Committee, um, pretty much the whole alphabet soup of Jewish organizations are members of the coalition whose responsibility is to provide education, awareness, raise funds. It includes all of the religious movements from Chabad, Reconstructionist rabbis, conservative reform movements. So the main function of the coalition is to make certain that there's no duplication of, of efforts from Jewish organizations and to coordinate the activities that take place once there's a disaster overseas. There are currently coalitions in existence for East Africa Relief, which provided assistance to the Abayudaya community in Uganda, as well as on a non-sectarian basis um, to the humanitarian drought that is taking place. And there's the Jewish Coalition for Syrian Refugees, which has raised close to $3 million and allocated that to everything from Israel, an Israeli-based volunteer group that is working in Lesbos, Greece, and elsewhere, um, as well as about two dozen different organizations. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin with Dina. Um, Dina, how has Avichai responded when tragedy strikes? And how did you get to that when disaster relief isn't explicit in Avichai's mission statement? You spoke a little bit about how, you know, your philanthropy looks different in those cases. Maybe you could explain a little bit more about what looks different about it. Okay, sure. Um, so um, if anyone's not familiar with, um, with Avichai Foundation, I just, uh, quick thing, I had, I had mentioned that we focus very much on Jewish day schools and overnight summer camp. Um, our process is, is fairly disciplined and um, there are a lot of parameters into how we do our grant making. So number one, we have a full board um, that makes all the decisions. Um, we do a ton of due diligence, site visits, focus groups, real assessments on the ground, and we bring those um, sort of internally generated programs to our board three times a year, and that's how decisions are made, and um, tons of evaluation, and a really um, strategic and disciplined approach to our philanthropy. That does not necessarily work when you're dealing with a crisis and an emergency. Um, and so we've had to revamp some of our protocols when dealing with, with um, you know, the, the crises that we've been involved in. Um, and those have actually evolved over time. We had, I, I would say our first emergency was not a natural disaster, but more of an economic and demographic um, when the uh, economic crisis in Argentina, and there was an influx of Jews to South, my, to South Florida, I think mostly focused in Miami, and the day schools there, um, again, our target audience, and just to reiterate, our focus in all of these um, interventions has been focusing on our target audience. So our business has not changed, but the way we do our business has changed. Um, so we, we really worked with the South Florida day schools to understand what their needs were, and we made direct grants to those schools, and over a period of time, we helped them absorb the new immigrants and help them with English as a second language. And um, that was our first foray into emergency. The way we did it internally was speaking to all the day schools, getting a sense of the need. Um, we did not wait until a board meeting, but we had an electronic one and our whole board decided on the funds and we were able to help 150 or so students. The second foray into crisis um, intervention was um, Katrina. And there we learned from our experience in South, in South Florida. We also spoke to the community. We spoke to the day schools. What we learned was that most of the day school students were being relocated to other communities. Ironically, most of them went to Houston. Um, and we helped the day schools in Houston absorb those students. Um, again, focusing on direct grants to the schools, doing our typical, although abbreviated due diligence with the schools in, um, in Houston. When we got to Sandy, we really shifted. Um, and we recognized that the needs were, and I, and I would say having someone going through it and understanding what was going on helped move us in that direction. Um, 
we, we shifted our approach fairly drastically. We did no due diligence. Um, we did not speak to any schools. We, um, we spoke to New York Federation and we recognized a, an incredible partner in New York Federation. Um, we ended up within a few weeks making a significant grant, I think $800,000 to, to be matched by Federation. And we um, used those funds for tuition subsidies for students um, affected by the storm and for faculty um, who were affected by the storm. The way the demographics in Sandy worked out is a lot of faculty were affected. There were 90 schools in the area, um, over 2,000 students were helped. Um, and the, the, the role I would say I played in that was my home, thank God, was really not affected, but everyone in the environs were. And I became a hub for everyone to come and charge their phones and have a hot dinner and actually sleeping. Um, and I met with a lot of the teachers and I was listening to what was they were going through and I, I realized that I need them for my, my kids. You know, like th their lives are gonna have to continue um, and I need them to keep my family and the community's families um, in check. And um, there was something that we had to do in terms of sending a message to say, we have your back. And so Sandy, and, and by the way, it wasn't just me. New York Federation agreed that this was a great idea. And so we uh, together partnered in doing that. Um, I would say from start to finish, that grant program was finalized in two weeks. We did not go to our full board. We did not write up materials. It was an executive committee decision and the money was sent out and within two weeks, people were getting their funds. Very different than how we had experienced it before. And now when we come to Harvey, um, I just wanna say Deborah Josla of New York Federation was a hero and um, she really deserves the credit for pulling that all together. Um, and now when we're experiencing Harvey, the precedents have all been set and we knew who to call. We called JFNA, amazing partners on the ground, doing all our due diligence, doing all of the legwork. Um, within, I think Labor Day weekend, we wrote it a grant letter and a check. Um, Mark's team has been fantastic. Um, we follow the same notion, right? We are, the business we're in are our day schools and our schools and the day school community. We're gonna support them through the crisis. We're gonna do it in the way that JFNA thinks is the right way. It turns out to be similar to the way we handled Sandy. Um, and that's it. And we're, and you know, it's just, it's an amazing, if anyone who knows the foundation, it's an amazing sort of shift in the way things happen between who needs to be involved, how decisions are made, who our partners are. Um, and so, you know, I would encourage others to think differently. You know, you can decide how you want, what your target audiences are for your philanthropy, but think about how your philanthropy can possibly shift to be more nimble and be more trusting. And um, we've seen that really pay off for us. Dina, thank you so much. Um, I feel like this is a perfect segue to talk about JFNA. Um, you mentioned you relied on them um, to tell you what was the right way to do things. So Mark, um, can you tell us how JFNA federations do this and how do they respond strategically in the middle of a disaster situation? Oh, we can't hear you. There you go. Yeah, there, I'm, I'm unmuted. Um, so sadly, through you know any number of crises, and frankly, this is whether it's a natural disaster or whether it's a war in Israel or whether it's you know bombings in France that were or terror attacks in France we're responding to. There is uh, you know there's an overarching framework to recognize that there are things that you need to do in the immediate. Um, you know, rest, rescue frankly is not so much our phase, but there are immediate recovery steps. There are near-term recovery and, and capacity building steps that need to be done with the major institutions on the ground uh, that need to be positioned to deliver service. And then there's the long-term reconstruction and resilience building prevention for the next emergency, and in some cases, advocacy work that may need to be done. So just taking live examples from the last three weeks uh, uh, with both uh, Harvey and, and uh, Irma, you know, what, what we do working with our local partners is canvas quickly all of the institutions in the community. What do they know? Uh, how have they been affected? How are their staffs been affected? Where are their constituencies? Who is checking? Start to build as quickly as possible as complete a data picture um, that allows you to see where are the different pockets of need 
uh, that are going to need to be addressed. Um, and you're moving on multiple fronts at once uh, to build that data picture to make sure that the immediate needs, shelter, food, uh, clothing, uh, uh, you know, are, are being met in the, you know, along with spiritual help and counseling help, you know, trauma counseling help where needed uh, are available really from the first days. Um, so when we sort of zoom out, uh, we've literally built, you know, in each of the immediate near-term and long-term uh, uh, sort of phases of this, we already have our early framework of which agencies are gonna need to play which roles, what are the uh, numbers that we're looking at, what kinds of costs might, might we be looking at, and that'll all change completely over the months to come as the picture becomes clearer. But, you know, we know as a result, even three weeks after the flood in uh, flooding in Houston, that we're dealing with a major episode on the scale of Katrina, um, you know, for the Houston community. More than 1,200 uh, households flooded, eight major communal institutions severely uh, flooded and damaged that have to relocate and, you know, get their get have short-term plans, medium-term plans for how they get back in operation. With Irma, the initial signals, frankly, were, you know, we seem to have dodged a bullet, people are okay, power's out, but, you know, institutional damage seems light. Uh, three days later, the picture looks, is starting to look very different, especially with extended power outages. We're now very concerned about uh, severe health risks for senior populations uh, in various pockets, particularly in Broward County. Now we're dealing with uh, literally a dozen different organized communities and other smaller communities. The job of chasing the information is more complex uh, and uh, you know, it still won't come to the scale of uh, uh, the impact on Houston, but it's not gonna be nothing uh, across Florida and we're trying to mobilize quickly. All of that has to be synced up with messaging for how we move a system into fundraising mode and to encourage people to give and encourage federations to consider emergency grants and to start talking with foundation partners, especially where we know there's a history of responding now like uh, Avichai and Jim Joseph, especially in the Jewish education area. But we're now in, in discussion between us and the Houston Federation with literally uh, dozens of foundations about how they might consider helping. So uh, all of that happens at once. Uh, <laughs> we can get into more details as people want. Okay, thank you. Um, David, I wanted to ask you, um, how, how can funders find organizations like Nahama that are working on the ground? And what are the best practices for vetting these organizations? I'm hoping you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, there's a couple different phases in disaster response and, you know, there's that moment where folks are right after, uh, you know, right after the event happens, a lot of organizations come into an area and they start doing the more immediate work. Um, and they, need, they have to ask for money right away because all of a sudden they have to staff up, they have to send people and they're spending a lot of money to do this work. Um, one of the best ways to kind of vet an organization is, is simply to call them. We get calls all the time from funders who may have heard of us through one means or another, but they have never actually given us some money before. Um, pick up the phone, call them. Um, any organization that's reputable is more than happy to answer your questions. Ask them, you know, where they're registered. Uh, you know, we're registered in Minnesota with the Secretary of State and the Attorney General's office. You can see our filings. You can know that we're an actual 501c3. Ask them for their 990s. You know, anyone who asks us for our 990s, we will send them right over. We're more than happy to share that information. Um, you know, check with organizations that you trust. Call the Federation. Call, you know, call the National Federation. Call the local Federation. They're going to tell you organizations that they know, that they've worked with in the past who they have vetted to save you the time and give you that peace of mind. Um, and when you call up, you know, organizations, you know, ask, ask the questions that you would want to know, how are you funded? You know, what will you actually do with the money that we give you? Who else funds you? Um, these are all important questions to ask. These are all questions are that are entirely acceptable to ask. 
and uh, and you should. Um, and an organization like mine is always more than happy to answer you. Um, in those immediate days when you're first trying to figure out who else is involved, I also encourage you to go to the National VOAD. It's the Volunteer Organizations Assisting in Disaster. It's an umbrella organization uh, that we belong to, that a lot of other folks belong to. Um, they will tell you reputable nonprofit, reputable disaster response nonprofits that are engaged in the community who are doing work there, uh, who are good shepherds of, of donations and do good work. Um, you know, it, it, it's a, those are some really easy ways to, to, to find out folks who that are, that are working in an area and, and vet them very quickly. Um, because, you know, for organizations like mine, immediate money is so important. About, you know, about 80% of the money for a disaster comes in in the first 10 to 12 days. Uh, so we're immediately out there asking for money, trying to raise enough to be out there long enough and for foundations, that, that often puts a lot of stress on you, especially when an organization like mine might come asking for funding and, and you've never heard of us before. When you start getting into the long-term recovery work, there's a little more time to vet organizations. There's a little more planning that goes involved because now you're talking about rebuilding homes as opposed to you know, trying to go in there and do muck and gut work to get at a problem before mold gets in and to try and help homeowners get back into their homes as quickly as possible. Great, thank you. Um, I have some questions for William and Maya. Um, Will, I think you mentioned that it's important when JDC is deciding how to respond to a disaster that there isn't a duplication of efforts um, being done. And I'm curious and hoping you can speak to how Jewish response to disaster can actually be coordinated so there isn't a duplication of efforts. Um, thanks, Shira. Part of the answer is that's why we helped form the Jewish Coalition for Disaster Response some 25 years ago. Um, we found that during the time of the Rwandan genocide, there were dozens of Jewish organizations raising funds um, for the victims of the genocide. And when, and JDC was active in working with a few Israeli organizations and sending doctors from Ethiopia and elsewhere. And the JDC contacted these other Jewish organizations that were raising funds for Rwanda. And we asked what they were doing with the funds that were being raised. And the answer was, quote, we're giving the funds to the International Committee of the Red Cross, which 25 years ago had very high administrative costs and there was a lot of waste in the funds that were being contributed to them. So at the time, because the JDC is a, is a well-trusted organization and well-honed organization in disaster relief and in other fields, um, we kind of served as the honest broker to create a coalition so that whenever there's a disaster and there are different Jewish organizations that are operational, we come together, we have a conversation about what each organization is doing to make sure there's no duplication of effort. And Maya and the JDC office in Israel coordinates what the Israeli foreign ministry is doing what Israeli volunteer organizations are doing so that we ensure that there's no duplication, that the dollars go exactly where is needed, and JFNA and other organizations raise awareness through the programs that the coalition brings to the fore and helps raise money that we distribute on a communal and collective basis. Thanks, Shira. Great, thank you. Um, Maya, maybe you could speak to JDC's unique role in responding to disaster. I know it's, it's, it's a bit different than the other organizations we have on the line. Absolutely, thank you. So 
We've been in this business for over 30 years, and in that time, we've established a global network of partners, and we focus on the countries that are particularly prone to natural disasters. Um, our response is always in full coordination with local actors because we understand that they have the language and the cultural sensitivities that they need to provide an adequate response. Our specific expertise is understanding the way that disasters can impact individuals. So what does it mean when you don't have access to water after a disaster has hit your community? What does it mean if you're living in a displaced persons camp in Haiti and you're a little girl and there aren't adequate toilets or lights at night? If you're a man in Barbuda who just got hit by Hurricane Irma, you've lost everything that you have, your home, you're in Antigua living with your family, and you don't know what you're going to come back to and what you're going to do for your livelihood since the entire tourist infrastructure has been wiped out. And moreover, right now what we're seeing in Haiti, what is it like to be a displaced person that's living in an area that didn't get a lot of news coverage, was hit by flooding, doesn't have a lot of infrastructure to begin with, and is now living, your person that's now living in a, in a temporary shelter, probably a school, with 500 other people, you're pregnant, and you don't have access to healthcare. This is where JDC comes in and tries to fill those gaps provide responses as quickly as possible, and come in with a nuanced approach to ensure that we're meeting humanitarian standards, are not creating more damage in the response, and are ensuring also that there's a long-term response. This is the hardest part often in a, in a disaster. There's a lot of excitement and, and emotion and, and desire to give in the immediate aftermath, and then it dwindles down in the long term. And we see that there's a definite need to respond to those underlying causes that made people much more vulnerable to the disasters to begin with because they weren't living in adequate housing that was up to earthquake standard or typhoon standard um, because they didn't have adequate livelihood, not climate smart adaptability, and didn't have livelihood, other options to fall back on should their fields, their banana fields be wiped out. Um, this is where we really want to emphasize the importance of disaster risk reduction and having a long-term response. Great, Maya. Thank you very much. Um, I want to pause right now. There are some questions coming in from the audience. Um, and I, I think this question, anybody can answer, but, but possibly Dina and Mark um, might want to go first. Um, the question is, what should funders research when a disaster hits? Mark, you wanna? Yeah, I'll, I'll dive in. So, you know, I think, um, I think Dina made the point earlier that, um, you know, if you wanna go into research mode, you're gonna be dealing with the long-term situation because there's no opportunity to really research deeply the way foundations might normally would in their funding processes and deal with the immediate needs of a community uh, in a situation like this. And I think that's responsible for their shift to recognize if they wanna be, if they wanna be on the ground quicker helping, they're gonna have to trust somebody who's actually in the scene and, and rest on their expertise and knowledge of the situation uh, and build that trusting relationship over time so that the partnership becomes uh, easy to leverage when fresh situations arise. Um, you know, with, with all the research that we're doing, you know, we're three weeks out in Houston and there, you know, there are some issues we won't know for six to eight weeks, like uh, how much is insurance not gonna cover uh, on the reconstruction or FEMA uh, on the reconstruction of buildings or how many of the families who might need tuition, who, who have been affected by flooding, will actually need tuition assistance, or they'll actually, you know, they have means they'll be okay. They don't want the communal funds to come to them. Those decisions can't be made in the week or two, you know, following a disaster. It takes time. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, on the other hand, if, if foundations are more interested in long-term, you know, reconstruction issues, prevention, you know, then there is time to actually wait and see, see how the work evolved, see what the long-term needs are, 
and uh, make a decision down the road about where you want to help. So I agree with Mark completely. I would, the only thing I would, um, I would add is I think one of the real lessons that we learned in, in our evolution in dealing with um, emergency funding was really how low the bar we need to be in terms of um, burdening the community and what they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of getting that kind of information. So finding the right people on the ground is enormously important. I think also understanding that there are needs that you can't even imagine um, is, is another big piece, meaning you wouldn't imagine that you would need to find an aftercare for, you know, for families or whatever. There are, there are needs that are very human needs that um, wouldn't come up when you're thinking about disaster relief. Um, the other thing is, unfortunately, there have been a number of disasters and the communities have bounced back and they may actually have some knowledge in terms of what they needed and what they might do differently. And if you really feel the need to do some research, maybe those are the communities to talk to once they're already in, um, in recovery mode. Um, and then you can learn what you might be able to do for the ones that are currently in crisis. So both of you brought up trust. Um, um, Mark brought up, you know, trusting the, the information that's coming to you to make these decisions. Um, so uh, a member is curious about what are the trusted sources of information and how can you be sure that what you're reading is truth? That question is really, really for anybody, um, but, but Mark did mention trust in his remarks. So I don't know if Mark, you wanna, we wanna respond to that. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief because I wanna make sure others have time to chime in too. So obviously a lot of that just depends on having relationships that are gonna be leverageable from before there was a crisis. Uh, and you know, so trust accrues over time and based on experience. Uh, you know, because we are networked the way we're networked, we know who the CEOs are in each of our communities. We know who key leadership are in each of our communities. And we know the relative strength and weaknesses of folks in different places. Uh, and with that comes our ability to gauge how much can we lean on the information that we're hearing and how much might we need to do a little more homework uh, to be digging. We also get incoming calls from other folks who are on the ground and reacting and sharing what they're seeing. We're dealing with that now quite actively in Florida. And so, you know, we can't just take that information and run with it. We actually have to go back to our contacts and communities and say, here's what we're hearing. What can you share? What are you seeing? What do you know? So we can try to build a, a composite picture. But there's no question that, you know, working together over time, you get to know who your partners are and you get to know what you can lean on uh, in terms of their ability to assess a situation. Great. Before we move on, does anybody else want to comment on the trust piece? Just to add on to what you know, Dina and Mark and, and even what David said earlier, um, knowing the organizations that you fund, knowing the history, knowing the background, being able to know that they are truly honest brokers and doing the, the appropriate thing with the funds that are, that are given is not something that can take place in the immediate aftermath of a disaster or during a crisis or a situation. And as David said earlier, you know, there's a direct correlation between philanthropic dollars that come in for a crisis response and media attention or education. So educating yourself in advance, doing the research into what Nechama is, what their overhead is, how responsible they've been in the past, or the JDC or the coalition or JFNA, or any of the actors that are present in the field is really incumbent on you as donors. And to have, you know, pre positioned thoughts of where your dollars go and how those dollars are best accrued. And so, for example, JDC works closely with Jewish communities around the world and with vetted known organizations that we have worked with over the past quarter of a century plus. 
to ensure that dollars that are given actually go to the programs and people in greatest need. So the trust factor is huge when it comes to giving philanthropic dollars during times of crisis or emergency. And, and I would just point out too, I mean, a lot of, most organizations like mine have been around for some time. So when you contact JFNA, when you contact organizations that you trust within the Jewish community, uh, they, they've worked with us in the past. They know who we are. They will be able to tell you about us and about other, uh, about other organizations as well as to how they manage dollars, how they uh, deal with their overhead, if they're responsible or not. Um, most, most of the time there is already a relationship there and they, they're able to give you a pretty solid sense of, uh, of how an organization acts and can do that vetting for you. And I, I highly encourage you to make use of you know, those resources and save yourself the time, especially when it is an emergency situation like the immediate aftermath of Harvey and even where we're at right now with Irma, um, to be able to quickly fund the organizations that, that are on the ground doing that more immediate work who, and who need those immediate funds then also to follow up with them afterwards and, and continue to build that relationship. And, you know, frankly, organizations like mine should be following up with you um, and just starting to build those relationships as well. But really, I encourage you to lean on JFNA and other organizations that, you know, will be able to really help you answer those questions. Great. Thank you so much. We actually have Steve Lear um, on the line. Steve, I know you're a longtime JFN member and saw a need for Nahama for creating it. What prompted you to found it? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if you're able to, we would love to hear your perspective. Let's see if technically it's working here. Oh, it doesn't look like he's here any longer. Okay, if he comes back, perhaps he'll be able to, to answer that question. In the meantime, um, we have a, um, a couple questions from, from members. Um, besides child care, what are some of the other needs we don't normally imagine after a disaster? And what impact does this lack of understanding awarenesses or awareness have on funding? Um, so I think uh, one of the things I would point out is um, uh, the impact on the sustainability of your communal institutions. So, you know, one of the reasons why Avi Chai and Jim Joseph are focusing in on the needs of educational institutions is um, the financial stability of those institutions is threatened when a chunk of their families suddenly lose their footing in a, you know, they lose their home, their whole kind of financial picture is turned upside down, suddenly they can't, uh, you know, they can't pay the tuition fees. And that may be people who are already on scholarship at some level, but you may now have full paying, uh, uh, you know, families who now can't actually manage to pay those full fees. That could be a multi-year impact on those families that the school is going to have to address. And obviously none of us want to lose those families uh, from the school system. And that can be true of Supplementary, you know, supplementary schools, early childhood programs, they, uh, JCC members, synagogue members, that impact ripples out across the community. When you have an institution like the JCC, which loses uh, almost all of its operating space, which, was, which is what has happened in Houston, um, it could be uh, half a year to a year before they incrementally get those spaces back. Uh, do they refund membership fees? What do they do about the fact that even if they can mount, uh, you know, programs in other spaces inside and beyond the Jewish community, uh, people may not be able to pay fees or they may not be able to command fees on a competitive basis for subpar services in the minds of consumers. So those kinds of impacts on institutional sustainability loom extremely large for the community might not be so uh, so present for the, you know, on the minds of, uh, of funders.
Thank you. Um, I think this next question, the, our JDC folks um, could probably respond best. Um, the question is, how does responding to an international disaster differ from a domestic, especially for affected Jewish communities? So um, having only responded internationally, um, I can refer to that and I look to my colleagues to do the, the comparative piece. Um, and I'll touch on that, but I also want to touch, uh, I didn't get a chance to say, to chime in about the other types of needs other than childcare, um, because I think that also relates to the, to the response. So uh, other than childcare, the other needs that JDC looks for in international responses, um, we look at water, temporary and short-term uh, shelter needs, different types of mechanisms that will enable people to slowly get back to their new normal. Um, and we also look at the emotional aspect of having gone through a trauma. Um, and we provide psychosocial support. And that's not something that um, has been so obvious to us in the past, and it's something that we've chosen to invest more um, in the most recent, in the past couple of years. And the reason is that we've seen that, first of all, the first responders are often quite burnt out. And sometimes those first responders are the community members themselves. It can take upwards of seven days, two weeks to, re to reach out to a community. So it's the community members that are providing first aid that are doing as much as they can in order to help one another. And they're often quite burnt out at that two week, three week stage. And we want to provide them with an opportunity to vent. Um, we also see that, you know, towards the three month or even one year range, if somebody hasn't been able to sort of overcome that trauma of losing loved ones, of having their lives rocked up at night, um, that that can often be a barrier to receiving services that exist or to getting back out into the fields and, and picking up the livelihood. Um, so we really try to, you know, analyze the needs and provide tailored responses that address the full spectrum of a person's lives, not just, you know, one, those immediate um, needs that you need, shelter, food, and so on. And we also try to look at the bridge um, that they need for a longer recovery. In the case of a Jewish community, um, we often work with the Jewish communities in advance, as in the case of Cuba, we developed a communication strategy with them for responding to disaster, phone trees, for understanding what the needs are, if there've been any fatalities. And then again, we'll provide that same tailored response to each individual and their family based on what they experienced in that particular disaster. I would just add that uh, I remember I was traveling back from Thailand and Sri Lanka following the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. And when I got to Kennedy Airport, there was the forecast of Katrina that was about to hit land and they didn't know exactly where it would hit. And I was just thinking to myself, What's the difference between what I just saw and experienced in Sri Lanka and Thailand compared to what it's going to be in the United States? And there were some differences because previously I had thought, oh, the U.S. is capable of responding much quicker. Uh, infrastructures in place will have a much better response. And we all saw what the actual response was in Katrina. Um, where we saw people giving gifts in kind and clothing that was sitting on highways for months, or trucks that were unable to get refrigeration into the, the affected area. We've experienced that outside of North America and in disasters. So there are similarities, and especially when you look at it through a Jewish lens. Of what, you know, Dina had mentioned the education for Argentinians in the United States. We had to deal with education in Argentina of day schools and structures that didn't have the economic ability to stay open and care for themselves. So there are areas that overlap. And the bottom line when it comes to crisis and disaster and emergency, it's vital needs first. And as Maya said, water, medicine, housing, 
and the ability to address those issues first. And for us, it's often the balance of what are vital needs within the Jewish community and the Jewish world, as opposed to the humanitarian needs beyond that. Thank you, Will. Steve, we can see you. Um, we're so happy that you're joining us. Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I don't know if you heard the question I posed to you earlier, so just allow me to repeat it. Um, you know, you're a longtime JFN member and you saw a need for founding Nahama. Um, what prompted you to, to found and start this organization? Um, perhaps you can speak to that a little bit um, in, the, in the short amount of time we have left. I was so interested in getting dirty that's, that's what it's all about. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who's here. Uh, Will, it's nice to see you again. Um, JDC, JFNA, JFN, all of these organizations who I'm not a staff member of any of them, coming together basically to be able to sound the horn regarding disaster response, I think is an absolute wonderful thing. Since 1993, I have been doing disaster response work in a hands-on manner uh, through Nakama. And I just wanted to share with people here the whys of why this is so important. First of all, from the individual standpoint, it's about overcoming a feeling of helplessness. In that if you're turning around and you're getting involved in disaster response and going to get your hands dirty, as the individual, I think everybody in this room knows how um, inspiring that is and how you just don't have that sense of helplessness. You're truly making a difference. My interest in Nechama and what the, one of the biggest lessons that I got from doing disaster response work is simply recognizing the importance of relationships over material items. All of our material items can be gone within five minutes, an hour, all of that. But it's the relationships that we have between each other that stands out, continues, makes the difference. As a parent, going on disaster response runs has been instrumental for me personally because what ended up happening is 20 years ago, I took my 16 year old on a disaster response run and guess what? He ended up working for FEMA, working for the Red Cross, working for Nakama, and now he's the president of the uh, board of Nakama. And he's dragged me right back into disaster response, which I thought I was actually going to retire from, but no, he dragged me right in. And as a Jew, the, the importance of getting involved with both the financial part of it and the hands-on part is truly doing the job of tikkun olam the hands-on um, uh, effect of repairing the world. Um, you know, when Jews help Jews, it's absolutely crucial. And the real quick story about that is when Grand Forks Synagogue went down, we went up, and this is where the team can all come together. But we went up, there were 50 of us that went up, we cleaned up the synagogue, we cleaned up 10 homes, and then we handed the synagogue $10,000 to rebuild. And you know what they said to us? The money was great, but having you here helping us get back on our feet was as valuable, if not more. And then the other part is as we carry our Jewish flag into helping others, all we do is we just demonstrate the fact that we care. We know that we care. Not everybody else knows that we care. But by doing this type of work, disaster response, both from a financial standpoint, planning standpoint, and the hands-on, we demonstrate that we care. So that's my story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, what, a, what a great surprise to have you join the call. Um, in the couple minutes we have left, I wanted to ask everyone, um, are, are there things Jewish funders should fund bef to mitigate disasters before they hit? <laughs> I 
Uh, so um, I think it's a great question. You know, as long as we're having this conversation in the midst of two major uh, natural disasters within uh, North America, the U.S., I would say first and foremost, I hope uh, you know you you know with your boards are thinking about what you can do now uh, during the crisis. Uh, the needs are enormous in both places. I mentioned earlier, we think that, uh, you know, the experience in Houston is probably at least a $30 million problem uh, for that community between short term and long term. Our system at this point, you know, including funds from the government of Israel, including generosity from foundations, including the Federation's efforts in Houston and nationally is uh, today at $12 million. We have a long way to go. Uh, so the need is urgent, uh, and many of those needs are for funds that are needed now uh, and in the coming weeks. Um, and we would encourage you to be thinking about how you could respond, and frankly, at least at this stage, as much as possible, unrestricted funds that allow the first responders, you know, to uh, uh, apply funds as needed where needed. For the longer term, um, you know, focusing on disaster, you know, preparedness, emergency preparedness, is important. Every institution needs to have an emergency preparedness plan, whether that's for disaster, for war, for terrorism, for um, you know health issues that surface uh, in the environment. There's any number of factors that can lead to an emergency. And the more preparation that has happened on the individual institutional level and on the communal level, the more prepared communities are gonna be to dive in, roll up their sleeves and do the work uh, that needs to be done in the immediate moment until other forces come into play uh, to work alongside them. Yes, Steve. Um, the, pro the proposal that I would make at this time is that we'd really try and get to be one disaster ahead of the game. And what that means is that we simply have some sort of campaign that we store money we store supplies at camps, we store at warehouses, whatever it's necessary, we store tools, we store anything and everything that can get us one disaster ahead of the disasters that are gonna come. So what occurs is that we can, um, we, we can respond exceptionally quickly, then turn the fundraising aspect on, turn on the getting of the people to be involved uh, through great marketing, great storytelling, et cetera, et cetera. But that would be the um, idea. That's what we had back in the 90s in trying to do it with Nahama, was trying to be one disaster ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for dedicating your time to having this extremely urgent and important discussion. Um, we're really so grateful that you could um, address the network and provide, um, provide much needed guidance on this, on this issue. Um, a couple, just one, actually one plug announcement before we close the webinar. We do have um, a program coming up um, JFN has a, a webinar on, it's a two-part series. The first one is going to be taking place on Monday, September 18th at 1230, um, entitled Lifting the Rock, What We Need to Know and Do About Charlottesville and Hate in America. And if you haven't RSVP'd or read about this program, please visit our website, jfunders.org, to see a bit more about this um, also timely and important program. Um, and, and, and sign up if you're able. So again, thank you to all of the speakers um, and please others that have questions that didn't get to ask, don't hesitate to shoot them to me. I'd be happy to connect you or forward them to any of the speakers. Um, and I think that concludes our, our webinar for today. Thank you so much, everyone.